authors can't be inundated by noise all day, every day, or their authorship goes downhill because they're not focused on the things they need to be focused on. So it's not arrogant or sort of power grabbing for a CEO to say the beacon and the true north and the strategy is mine and my responsibility. I'll take input, we'll have conversations about it, but ultimately my responsibility in that role. That's not arrogant. That is actually reassuring to an organization because they know, okay, that's set. Now I know what I can focus on with my expertise and with my time and with my efforts. And that'll keep people from getting exhausted. You cannot run a beehive with 450 queens. You just don't get any work done. This is the Leadership Foundry Podcast. I'm your host this week. I'm Brandon Smith. Our guest today is Dr. Chad Cosley. Chad is the president and CEO of Blue Willow Biologics. Folks, they make vaccines. I've known Chad for almost 20 years. He and I were business school classmates. And what I love about this conversation is not only is Chad going to talk about his leadership journey, specifically, he's going to talk about what he learned being a first-time CEO because this has been a new experience for Chad, particularly during the pandemic. So he's dealing with not only the pressure of vaccines and vaccine production, but also learning how to be a CEO within all of that. He's got some great stories. He's a great storyteller. I know you're gonna love the conversation. Take lots of notes, I did, and pay particular attention to some of the things that Chad learned as a first time CEO that maybe would have worked for him in other leadership roles, but he had to make adjustments. And of course, at the very end of our conversation, I'll share all of my notes. I know you're going to love it. Stay tuned. Welding together practical insights and powerful conversations to forge world-class leaders. This is the Leadership Foundry Podcast. Chad, I am so excited about our conversation. You and I have known each other for a pretty long time, my friend. It's it's been, time, it's, yeah. it's been almost 20 years, if you can believe it. Um, so I, I love your journey. I love your story. And I really love the leadership experiences that you've had in your career, even more recently, in, in, in such a critical time. But I don't want to divulge all that. I want you to share that with the listeners today. So if you don't mind, before we jump into your leadership lessons and, and some of those specifics, share for the listeners and viewers, what's been your career journey up to this point? Yeah, thanks, Brandon. I appreciate the time today. This is going to be fun. Um, I think a lot of people feel that their journey has been very strange. And I think if I was describing it to myself, I might say that. But I think what ends up happening is the more people you talk to, the more people who have sort of different experiences and somewhat odd trajectories towards where they ended up. And maybe that's Maybe that's the norm, actually. So, mm. um, so my background is I'm a family physician by training. So I went to medical school and did that and went through residency. So I'm not somebody who's in business because I finished medical school and then never practiced. So I went through medical training, residency, practiced for a few years and knew that I wanted a more diverse career than just seeing patients over time. And seeing patients all the time is great. Just for me, it wasn't going to be a perfect fit over my career. Mm-hmm. So a few years after practice, I decided to get my MBA. A lot of doctors who get their MBA do it for the primary reason of going into leadership in a hospital setting. And that was actually not my focus. It was very much an entrepreneurial study, the things I knew nothing about, finance, accounting, all the things that you would learn nothing about in medical school or residency. So for me, the MBA was a really transformational degree. It was not simply sort of moving to the next step. It was really a different set of things entirely. I'd never had a marketing class. I'd never had a marketing job. Almost every class in med school, maybe with the exception of service ops, had nothing to almost do with what I'd done before. So following the MBA, I took a little bit of a parallel dual career path. I did continue to see patients, but on a limited basis, because I wanted that in my background and didn't know exactly what I was going to do with clinical medicine. But I also started working in private equity and small venture capital, maybe I mean like angel fund work, sort of doing scientific advising to investment groups about various technology businesses that I could inform them about the business and then they would make the good business decisions Mm. and did that for a little while. And eventually that evolved into a more formal role as the leader of an investment group who made a number of investments into small technology companies. 
over to the other parallel, I was still seeing patients on a part-time basis. So I really had two careers for a good long while, Wow! which may be the most odd part of this story. That's a little bit unusual to be able to pull that off. Clinical medicine sort of allows it because you can do something a couple days a week and not have anybody sort of snarl and say, wait a minute, <laughs> what are you doing here? Um, then COVID hit. I fast forwarded a couple decades there, but um, then COVID hit and the practice that I was the owner of and that I was running in Decatur, Georgia, took a very big hit financially as a lot of small primary care practices did. We lost about 60% of our revenue short term. So we had to do some restructuring and two things collided in life as they often do in sort of this moment for my career and for me personally. One was the realization that we needed to cut back on a provider. I was the owner and I was a provider. So there's an obvious candidate for the cutback. <laughs> when simultaneously a biotech job sort of crossed my radar as the leader of a small, albeit exciting, small biotech company that was doing vaccine development that I had been involved with because of the investment parallel. So those two things collided in the spring of 2020, right in the middle of the mm. worst of the pandemic. Atlanta was shut down, practice was struggling. We were trying to see patients virtually and getting up to speed on that on telemedicine and um, so I took a virtual job as the CEO of a small biotech company, um, actually based outside of Atlanta up in Michigan called Blue Willow Biologics, where I'm the CEO now, and continued to be a business supporter of the practice and chief cheerleader and advisor when my advice was wise to the people who were actually doing all the work at the practice. But kudos to them. They kept that business alive and now it's thriving again. And I have a new role as a CEO and I've been in it for about two years. So I really came into an operational business role in a very serendipitous way. I had yeah. this business background that I was almost using as a consultant at the same time that medicine took this big hit. And then the consulting became an operational job and here we are. So on a daily basis now I'm the full-time CEO and then I spend some of my time, but frankly, not a lot of my time helping the practice when it needs my help. But fortunately, we have tremendous people there who need my help less and less every day. <laughs> so they call me when they need me. But operationally now, in terms of my operations every day, I'm the CEO of a biotech company and have been for the last couple of years. Yeah. And so I think it's also important too, while you might say you didn't go the traditional corporate route to get to CEO, you did have leadership roles in the practice. I mean, you were Absolutely. leading that practice. You were bringing on new associates and, and new physicians. And there was there was some, some management there and running a practice which kind of, kind of and, got you kind of built up some of your muscles that it maybe equipped you to make that leap. And actually, I think what leaders can sometimes trust that maybe it took me a couple months to trust in myself was that those skills and background were transferable, yeah. that the issues of managing people and not just managing people, but inspiring people and identifying the right people and doing the leadership structure things in a medical practice or frankly, a complicated ice cream shop or a biotech company, I've never run an ice cream shop, by the way, so I don't want to <laughs> underestimate how complicated that is. But nevertheless, otherwise, I think a lot of those skill sets, identifying what your role is, making sure that you're letting people do their roles, putting the right people in the right role, setting the strategy for the organization, those sort of top level things, if you focus on those as a leader, are very transferable. And it probably took me a few months in my current role to trust that, mm. sort of wake up a lot of mornings and say, okay, this is so different. This is biotech. Surely there's something I'm missing about how I should be building this team or how I should be talking to this team or listening to this team. And actually, as I've done it for almost two years now, a lot of it transfers. It really does. The technical aspects don't, obviously, but the, the leadership stuff, I think, largely does. You know, it's funny hearing you talk about that. I, I cannot help but remember flashbacks. So so you and I have known each other since business school. We went to business yep. school together. We were classmates. We were. And I, I remember almost 20 years ago, you turning one day and saying, you know, this whole time I was wondering, am I analytical? Because I didn't have this training in finance or accounting and Absolutely, right. I'm analytical. I'm a physician. You have to be analytical to do that job. <laughs> I was analyzing different it, things. It, but I was it, it translates, but I was putting it right. in this bucket. So I think it's the same kind of idea. Trust that that core thing is there, even though the context might have changed. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. So, I think that's true on the technical side, but I especially think it's true on the people side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The skills, okay. are, the skills are very transferable if you trust yourself that you can, you know. So you can do that. So I want to talk about leadership lessons, but I also really want to put it within the context of being a first-time CEO because that's yeah. a little different. 
I mean, yep. I, 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 I work with folks that make that transition and it's a different animal. Going from VP to SVP to, to CEO, this, there, there's, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a change. So maybe we can, I'll let you riff in whatever direction you go and you do it so well, Chad, but we can talk about just general leadership lessons or you can put them within the context of, and this is how it showed up as a first time CEO that maybe surprised me, but navigated through. Yeah, I think part of it is trusting yourself. I've already said that, so I won't go back over that. But I think being a first-time CEO, you have to do a couple things. Number one, you have to rem remind yourself that no one's ever done anything for the first time until they did. So give yourself mm -hmm. a break occasionally, right? I mean, whether it's your first time in an SVP role or whatever role, whether it's the first time you're the captain of a team or the CEO of a company or whatever it is, being scared by that and pretending that no one else has ever been in that situation and it might not be something you can get through, I think is a big mistake because the reality is nobody's gotten experience except by getting experience. So go, go get yours, right? And get it every day and get after that. So that I think was a, was a key point for me, just sort of giving myself the confidence that you can do this. You've got good people skills. You're a good communicator. You do have some analytical background. You have to transfer it over to a different set of analytics, but that's not the hardest thing in the world if you work hard. So I think that was a big piece of it. Um, and that exudes sort of the executive presence that will get you the help within your organization that every good leader needs, right? If you question, not whether you're going to make every decision correctly, but if you question your ability to even analyze the strategy and help the team come to the right conclusions or get to the right place. If People are going to sense that. And mm. that can be really, really tough on them and you. Um, and it's all unnecessary. I think you should just, you know, you're not going to make every decision right. No CEO does. No leader does. So don't pretend that. If you do make a mistake, don't fall back on, oh, I wouldn't have made that mistake if I'd been a CEO before. Probably not. There's some experienced CEOs out there making a lot of mistakes right now too. That's okay. Surround your good, yourself with good people who can, tell you when you're making a mistake, trust their judgment and, and work with that. So it went away pretty quickly, actually, because of those core principles, just sort of the foundational trust in yourself, foundational trust in the people around you, and sort of the self calming around, you're not going to get this right every time. And don't blame inexperience when that happens, because it may be just that business is hard and Sometimes you take limited information and you make the best decisions you can make and they come out wrong. And a super experienced CEO with the same information might have made the same mistake and gone home and said, man, I'm really experienced. So gosh darn. Whereas you can't go home and say, well, I'm really experienced. I'm sure inexperienced. I'm really, I'm sure I screwed that up because I've only been in this job six months because that's self-defeating. And I think it's organizationally defeating. Yeah. So. Beautiful. I, I, I love that. So there's this idea of you know, trusting yourself, trusting your abilities. And I love the fact that you translated that into, and I even wrote on my notes here, equal sign exudes executive presence. Because when you're, when you walk into a room with that level of trust and it's not, it's not cockiness. And I, I want to put this oh. in context. You're not saying oh. show cocky, just, just confident that as a mentor of mine shared with me years ago, he would say that kind of I'm a, when you're at your best, you're enough in your limitedness. Like I, yep. I'm enough in my limitedness. I'm not perfect, but I, I, I'm enough. I can ask good questions. I can pull the right answers from, from, from the right people. So right. I, I love that. So I, I wanted to dive a little bit more into this experience because to go back in your story, just to remind everybody, you're the CEO of a biotech company that focuses on vaccine work and you happen to step into that role in the beginning yep. of a pandemic. When vaccines- the Beginning of a pandemic. When vaccines were- Pretty hot conversation. Yeah, so, a, little, kind of, a little bit of a thing over the last couple of years. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, so a, a lot of spotlight in terms of the kind of work that you all do. What was it like leading in that environment? It was a little bit of drinking from a fire hose, obviously. And I do think that that could highlight a challenge sort of on what we just talked about. I did have to work every day to make sure that the fire hose I was sensing some days wasn't my inexperience as a CEO versus this is just what vaccine companies are going through right now, especially mm. small ones with new technology that may or may not be relevant to the COVID pandemic. So there were days when the amount of things coming at us was could be overwhelming to anybody. And I don't know if every day I figured out whether, you know, if, 
if I'd been in the role probably pre-COVID, for example, I would see the difference in flow and therefore know it was COVID or if this was just the flow of running this company. So I think that part was hard to differentiate. So I tried not to focus on it too much. I tried to just break it down into what can we accomplish today and what can we accomplish this week and how do we make sure that all of that has a direction that is not being influenced too much by the noise. Um, as the CEO, you know, we have investors, we have outside people who are interested in the company. We have some people who are interested in our technology because it's fairly novel. There's a, there was a lot of noise. Have you done this? Have you thought about this? I read this in the New York Times this morning. Did you hear Anthony Fauci on TV this morning? All of that was coming in and it could be very overwhelming noise. So you needed some first principles, things that are and are not worthy of our organizational time this week, this day, this hour. And I think as the CEO needed to be a little bit of a filter and a beacon for that. I think it was one of the roles of the CEO in that job, because I know all of our employees were probably getting this. Many of them had been with the company for longer than me, maybe had greater contacts that were interested in vaccines outside of this. So I knew our whole organization was getting peppered on our cell phones by investors and interested parties and PR firms that wanted to represent us for the first time. It was endless. And... Um, so, that, so I think that was, that was a really interesting experience. And what I didn't let it do, which I think was smart, and I would encourage others to take this in times of whether they be crises or just overwhelming business environments, I didn't let it turn it into an 80 hour a week job. Right. Just didn't. And figured, you know, we've got other people. If, if it's taking all of us 80 hours a week to process it, we're processing too many things. Let's get some things off our plate. We're listening to some noise that we shouldn't be listening to. Let's go back and look at first principles. What's our strategy? How does this fit with our strategy? Is the latest news out of the NIH or the FDA about the latest COVID vaccine potential relevant or not relevant to our technology? And if it's not, stop, let's not spend hours spinning up about it just because we got a bunch of tweets that might be interesting this week. So, um, so I think that was, that was useful. Yeah, you know, and, and I don't think the team, we didn't wear the team out because of it. And I think that helped. I think what you did there too, uh, so well, and I hope everyone kind of heard it, is one of the important jobs and roles that a CEO plays is focus and alignment in the business. No, no doubt. No matter what organization it is, there's gonna be a lot of noise. You happen to just be in a slightly no noisier context than most, but a lot of noise. And so- A lot of noise. What, and I love that you boil it down to, you gotta have your, your first principles. You need to have your unique point of view as a CEO in order to create those first principles, which creates focus and alignment. So the team knows what to, what to right. anchor to. And the team expects it of you. People don't like yeah. that feeling overwhelmed by noise. and. You know, we may talk about author editor a little bit specifically, because I know that's a topic that's close to your heart, obviously close to your publishing. So <laughs> I, I use that as well. And, you know, the, the authors can't be inundated by noise all day, every day, or their authorship goes downhill because they're not focused on the things they need to be focused on. So it's not arrogant or sort of power grabbing for a CEO to say the beacon and the true north and the strategy is mine and it, my responsibility. I'll take input, we'll have conversations about it, but ultimately my responsibility in that role, that's not arrogant. That is actually reassuring to an organization because they know, okay, that's set. Now I know what I can focus on with my expertise and with my time and with my efforts. And that'll keep people from getting exhausted. You cannot run a beehive with 450 queens. You just don't get any work done. <laughs> so, right. um, so I think that was really helpful to the organization. And I, I think coming from more of a collaborative environment, like a primary care practice, that probably took me a little bit. Um, in the practice, I'm probably more of a, I don't know, consensus is something you build in every organization. So maybe that wouldn't be the best way to say it, but it's a different process of building consensus in a, in a service organization, like a primary care practice. In a business, yeah, you have meetings to talk about strategy, but eventually somebody's got to set it or you'll right. go every direction and therefore no direction at all for, for too long. Well, and, so. and it takes a lot of time to create that 100% consensus. You know, you have right. one person over here on the, on the sidelines, you say, you know, 
Sanchez over there, he's not quite bought in. Let's let's keep on talking. Well, there's time. You're losing time. So at some point, right. someone just has to say, this is the way we're going to go. A, we've, we've talked about this for long enough. Yeah. This is the strategy. Now, now, let's have real good debate about how, how to execute it. But you never get to a good debate about how to execute a strategy if nobody sets it. Yeah. And uh, so so I think that was that was helpful. And that helped us sort of stay a little bit muffled from the nonsense because it was a lot of nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now <laughs> now I want to pivot a little bit more um, into that experience. So uh, one of the topics when we talk about kind of leadership and leading today, it's hard to talk about that without also touching on the topic of leading change. Yeah. Looking at what we have, deciding what we want to keep, deciding what we need to evolve or transform. So I, I'll let you share as much as you you want to share, but I'd be I'd be curious how did that idea of transformation or change play out in your time as CEO, and and mm-hmm. what guidance and counsel would you give to a new CEO in terms of the right way to manage that? You know, it's kind of like yeah. it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You know, you don't want to go too slow, you don't want to go too fast. Like what's right. the what's that? Just just right. Yeah, we had a natural inflection point for a biotech company without getting into too much of the technical part of it, because that would be a lot of time that we don't have. But when vaccine com- when our company was getting close to a lot of human clinical trials, as opposed to what we call preclinical work, where you're doing animal studies on vaccines and preparing for those pivotal trials that get you all the way to a product, the transition from a company that's doing largely preclinical work to a company that is doing clinical work is a DNA change for an organization. Mm. because the funding mechanisms are different because the amount of money needed to do human clinical trials is so much greater. The non-dilutive funding that you often get through grants and governments sort of dries up pretty much, not entirely, but pretty much. And you have to go out and get different kinds of funding. The skill sets that you need from your science team change. You add skill sets that you need regulatory because, you know, honestly, regulating animal studies is very different than regulating human studies. So without, again, without too much technical, we were at a place where every biotech company, if they're developing a medicine or in this case, a vaccine reaches this inflection point where you really have to change the DNA in the organization. And that was happening on top of COVID where we couldn't work together with a CEO who'd never been a CEO before. So (laughs) it was very, very interesting times. And to the other point, we did a good job keeping the noise out and focusing and not working 80 hours a week just because we pretended that would be effective. Um, I think, again, it comes back to that beacon. First of all, you have to explain in context the reason for the change. Change, I don't believe, can be done because an organization has decided internally that it's not that it's not doing a good job or it's not performing optimally and there's no details provided other than we're going to just change things up here to do something different. You know, because that that's scary to an organization and unnecessarily so because if you haven't thought through the reasons for your change and you can't enunciate them in an honest and transparent way to your organization, you need to go back to the beginning. Mm. And say, Wait a minute. Okay. This is not change for change sake because change for change sake just freaks people out. But if you can articulate again, the strategy and say, this is why we need to make these changes. This is why what we've been can't be what we are in the future, whether it's the markets changed or in our case, the stage of the company was changing. There's, there could be a lot of good reasons that you need change. Maybe it's just poor market performance. Maybe you have a bad culture internally in the organization. Within reason to the degree that it's allowed without disparaging individuals, I think you have to be transparent about that stuff. I just, you know, it's your job as the CEO to figure out how transparent you can be with an organization. If it's HR changes, I think that's a different piece that has to be handled delicately. But people can handle the truth. What they don't like is being patronized by being told this organization I've worked for a long time is going through a bunch of changes, but we're not going to tell you why. Mm. It's actually pretty insulting to somebody, right? They've been working in an important job for a long time. They've been executing a certain strategy. Now we're going to change the strategy for reasons that are not going to be explained just because management said so, or the board decided, or, you know, if I was, that's no fun. (laughs) That's no fun. So, so I think that was in our particular case, it was about consistent messaging around that issue of this isn't because we've done anything wrong. It's because we've done everything right. But when you do everything right in this industry, you reach these inflection points where continuing to do that right isn't going to work because the game's changed. We're right. in a different game now. We're really good volleyball players. We're about to play basketball. Skill skill sets different, right? So, um, 
So I think it just communication, transparent communication, and of course, consistency. And, um, and this is one, this podcast is probably already showing it, but I think out loud. And for leaders who think out loud, mm. I think that that has to be, you have to be cautious about that because we all do a little decision-making in our head before we get to where we want to be. Yeah. Um, I won't share the details, but my Myers-Briggs personality type, just as one assessment would say, Chad's going to think out loud. <laughs> and that's great. That's fine. That works sometimes. <laughs> Other times you got to temper that. Maybe find an outside resource that you can think out loud with, maybe a spouse, maybe a wall, maybe a mirror, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. <laughs> but, 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 Thinking out loud as the head of an organization is dangerous because it can be dangerous because people will say, well, you know, his conclusion on Thursday didn't jive with his outline thinking on Tuesday. Yeah. And in your head, you're like, well, yeah, but that was just thinking on Tuesday. Thursday's the message. <laughs> if they heard both, you've neutered, you've neutered Thursday by too much vocal meandering on Tuesday. So, so I, I had to learn a little bit of that. And I stepped in it a few times as we all do and had to re-explain myself a couple of times and that's okay. Cause that comes across as transparent and build your credibility too. But uh, in general, I would encourage out loud thinkers to do less of it. You're so funny hearing But you I would say also that. encourage internal thinkers to do a little more of it. Agreed. Agreed. Because in well, absence of communication, there's a medium people, here that has to be reached. Otherwise you're not worst. communicating well on either. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. I know some people who are very introverted in their management leadership style. And that too has to be, I think, adjusted because then you're just, no, nobody knows what you're thinking ever. Yeah. And then that right. creates a lot of, because again, uh, the unknown is anxiety producing. Too Absolutely. much noise, anxiety producing. So it's, it's right. calming that down. It's funny hearing you talk. I won't, I won't bore the audience with the whole story, but I was on a podcast as a guest with a serial entrepreneur and he had this podcast. We were talking about this whole idea of, of thinking out loud. And he was like, oh my gosh, that totally resonates with me because he's the CEO of a lot of different businesses. One's a logistics kind of trucking transportation business. Yep. He said, so I'm doing a town hall the other day and I stand up there and I said, you know, maybe we need to re-examine our fleet. You know, maybe we're a little, a little shy on vans. Just something for us to think about. He says, I, I leave, go home. Next day, come into the yep. office. Waiting on my desk is six purchase orders for brand new white vans that are all parked in the parking lot. Absolutely. <laughs> and I said, well, I was just like, Maybe we need to think of that. But nope, they, they took that as a mandate, a, a decision, and they had six brand new vans just sitting out there waiting, waiting for him. Yeah. So yeah. It's, you, you remind us that if we are going to think out loud, we need, to, we, we need to put parameters around that when we do it. Like, let everybody know, yes. I'm about to go through a period of thinking out loud. No one should make decisions on what I'm about to say. We're just going to explore. So yeah, right. that's, right. that's and great. I think think out loud meetings that are designated as such occasionally, not all day, every day, or just you know having fun. But yeah, I, I totally and completely agree with that. In scientific, it, in, in scientific realms too, people who came up through sort of a bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, postdoc, scientific, very hierarchical kind of industry, it can be even more so. Because there's less of this accepted culture that everybody's kind of an equal intellectually. We have different, you know, job titles. And obviously there's a, there's a last say that I sort of think in that realm a little bit, but many of our scientists don't. And it can be to your point when a CEO says something, even if it's thinking out loud, unless clearly identified as such it, within those kinds of organizations, it can really hit them hard because they're like, wait a minute, you know, the, the person, and I remember this from my medical training, we had white coats that were different links based upon how quote unquote important you were on the medical hierarchy at the University of Michigan Hospital. The medical system should not be proud of this, but it was very real that if somebody with a slightly longer coat than you spoke, that was the word from the white coat of God. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, and I'm exaggerating it, of course, a little bit for the for effect of this message, but be careful about the organizational. If you have the, if you have a culture that's sort of beanbaggish and everybody's sitting around, then you can probably think out loud a little more freely because everybody gets it. But if you're in an organization that thinks hierarchically, and there are some industries that do this more so than others, I think you got to be careful about it. Yeah, I love that. Well, Chad, I mean, we could keep talking all day long. Yeah. But this is this has Sorry, been this, getting a little long. This has been amazing. So, uh, just to kind of start to close us a little bit here, uh, I always like to ask this final question on the Leadership Boundary Podcast. Yep. What's one maybe tip, trick, hack, piece of practical advice you might have for us as leaders? Something that you know we we could start to think about or or notice or do starting tomorrow to make us more effective. Uh, and make our teams that much more effective. Yep. 
totally unrelated to anything else we've spoken about. I try and I have found, and it's uncomfortable for me, which is the point of the takeaway. Do something before 10 a.m. that you don't want to do that day, mm. that you're dreading. Dreading is maybe a little bit heavy, but the conversation that's the one that you kind of been putting off because it doesn't have to happen today, but it should happen this week and it didn't happen this week. Do it before 10 a.m. every day. The email that needs to be responded to that's a little potentially a little bit testy within, you know, either within or outside the organization, do it before 10 a.m. that day. I mean, 9 a.m. if you're an early riser, you get the point. The problem, if those things hang out there, they do two things. Number one, they get pushed off to the next day because we all get tired towards the end of our days. And that's not when we want to confront the most difficult parts of our job. Number two, they hang over your head throughout the day. If you wake up in the morning and you're like, this is going to be a pretty good day, but man, I got to do that one thing. If, if that one thing's still on your mind at two in the afternoon, you are sucking creativity out of your organization. It's certainly out of yourself. And you're also sucking some of the joy out of your job. So I would encourage people, if you have a list of to-dos every day or however you organize your to-do list, take the one that you're like, well, yeah, I'll do that after I do all the fun stuff. No, 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 no. Take that one, put up in front of the knock it off. And, and if you can't think of one that day, you're doing a darn good job, number one, or two, you're not thinking hard enough because there's probably something. <laughs> there's, pro there's an HR conversation that you've put off that you need to have. There's a feedback for a great employee that you don't give that person constructive, but more maybe redirectional feedback as often as you should, because generally they're an A performer. So they're not on your radar is the problem. So you put it off, you put it off, you put it off, do that one. So mm. I'll stop there, but before 10 a.m., whatever's the one you're least likely to check off, make sure you check it off. Great piece of advice. I love that. I, I uh, could practice that a little bit more myself, my friend. It's really, really good. You make some great points there. Well, if people want to yeah. follow you- It's a hard one for me. I, I don't do oh. it naturally. You have to do it. On, it's an unnatural act. Well, you, it's, well, you know, it's, it's like I have my, my little to-do list. It's a little yellow pad that I update every week. And, and what happens is if I don't do those things, I scratch everything off except for that item. And then I start my new list for the next week. And then that item goes to the new list and the same thing happens. And it just gets, right. keeps getting punted down the road. Right. And what, you, what I end up doing is I just end up making the list longer of easy things. So I have more lines. So I accomplish more. And I just put five more easy things on the list. I cross all those off and the list looks better. So I, I did 20 of 21 things. It's just the, the one I is The do. most consequential thing is the one, not yeah, the 20. That's right. <laughs> So, anyway. so if people want to learn more about you, follow you, follow the work that you're all, you all are doing at Blue Willow, where, where, where can they go? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. I probably should be more active there. Honestly, it's a bit of self-criticism there. I don't do as much on LinkedIn. Um, Blue Willow Biologics is our name of our company. That's easily Googleable. Um, those are probably the biggest things. But, uh, you know, we're sort of in the trenches developing intranasal vaccines. So a lot of what we do isn't real PR related. It's more related to how government funders and people who are specific to the biotech world are funded. So I don't do a lot of social media stuff in part because it can increase the noise. And there are CEOs who need to do that for the publicity of their company or to drive the share price. That's a different situation than we're in. So I'm, I don't, I don't intentionally sort of hide from anybody, but I'm not probably as visible out there as others just because the nature of the role doesn't call for it. I think it makes sense. And and you could end up actually creating more noise if you did, more if, noise. You, if you were more active. And right now, that's not what the organization uh, it's not needs. not what the organization yeah. needs. Yeah. yeah. Well, Chad, this was great. As always, my friend, really yeah. good to have you on. Uh, I look forward to the next time we get to catch up and thank you for all your brilliant insights. Brilliant might be an exaggeration, but I do appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. And this has been a lot of fun. Folks, I know I just didn't disappoint. That conversation with Chad was a really, really good one. He had so many great things for all of us to take away. And, and admittedly, I'm a huge fan of his. So a few things I wanna highlight that I made particular notes on. As first time CEO, he learned a couple of things. First, he learned, hey, trust your own abilities. Trust yourself. Everyone has does something for the first time. So don't be too hard on yourself if you make a stumble. And a lot of the skill sets that you learn in one arena, like him managing a medical practice, can transfer into another arena, like him being the CEO of a biotech company. So I love that as a first one. I love the fact that he talked about making sure that as you and the organization are drinking from a fire hose, in particular, in this case, there's so much media and attention on vaccines that was creating a lot of distraction for the team. 
You need to come up with, as Chad puts it, your first principles as a CEO. So what are those things you really want to use to kind of focus the organization and keep a lot of that noise out? I love that. And then I also love the fact that he talked about the importance of making sure when you're trying to either change the DNA of an organization, as he used his, his terms, or, or culture, that you're being really clear on the why, why you're trying to make that change and be as transparent as possible, given you can't be transparent about everything, but that transparency really helps to enhance trust while also managing not thinking out loud too much. So it's a balance there, transparent, not too transparent and make sure we're not thinking out loud. That can create some confusion as well. So I love, we could keep going, but I love those highlights from the conversation. Those really stuck with me. I'm curious what stuck with you, but regardless, I hope you took something from the conversation to make you a better leader starting tomorrow.